Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, last week we started a new series called Made for Mission. And as I had seen, as I had said last week, God has called each one of us to be part of a mission. God's getting ready to pour out his spirit. And he wants each one of us to be part of what he is doing. Isn't that awesome? Last week we talked about God calling Matthew and how uh, he's a tax collector. You know, everybody looked down on him and God called him and he got up and he followed Jesus. And just like Matthew, God is calling all of us to step out in faith with expectation. This morning, we're going to be uh, continuing this idea of, of getting up and uh, being on mission with God by looking at what our mission is. You know, um, it's, it's kind of, should be the next logical question, right? It's like, okay, I'm called, so now what's my mission? And the best way to answer this question is, is to look at Jesus. Because Jesus had a mission. He had a clear mission. We call that mission the good news, the gospel. What's the gospel? The gospel is we're all sinners, destined for eternal separation with God. God sent his son, come to this world to live a sinless life pure life. Jesus did that. He lived a sinless life. And then he offered that life as a sacrifice, as a payment for our sins. And if we accept that gift, if we believe in our heart and confess it with our mouth, like the Bible says, we are saved. That was his mission. It was clear. And, and you know, Jesus was resolute in it. He, uh, he was all in. We're going to be in Luke chapter 9 this morning. And if we look at verse 51, Luke chapter 9, verse 51, it says, As the time drew near for him, talking about Jesus, to ascend to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. His eyes were fixed on Jerusalem. He's like, okay, I'm going to go fulfill the purpose that God had for me. And, and really, you know, his mission was to save the lost. He would accomplish this by paying the price for our sins on the cross. And that was going to be taking place in Jerusalem. And so Jesus is heading out to Jerusalem. And, and with great intentionality and courage, he knew where he was going. He set out resolutely to go there. And his mission was bigger than his life. And we, you know, we don't think about that sometimes. You know, it was more important than his physical desires. You know, when we think of Jesus on earth, he's like, well, yeah, he's God. He was also man, fully man. He had his own desires, physical desires, and, and uh, ambition, well, ambitions, emotional needs, and things like that. And he was willing to put that away and focus on his mission. He was willing to put that aside. Why? For us. Because he loved us. That was his mission. And by accepting that free gift of salvation, we have all been given a mission as well. And our mission is to follow Jesus. That's our mission. Earlier in the chapter, Jesus uh, uh, told us point blank what that means, what it means to follow him. Let's take a look at it in verse 23 in Luke chapter 9. It says, Then he said to the crowd, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross daily, and follow me. I grew up in church. Many of you know my, my story. Uh, I, my parents took us to church every week. During the week, we, uh, my brother and I, we were, 
We went to a, a young adults group at our church. We had youth group for it, and then we went to young adults group. There were, and then we'd all go out to eat afterwards at night. We'd go to the local diner. It was, it was a fun time. There were times that we would even uh, uh, meet up with another church that was in Brooklyn. We were in Queens. There was another church in Brooklyn, and they had a sand volleyball court on their property. You know, and so we would go there and meet up with them, and we'd have games of volleyball you know, during the summer. And it was great. It was great to hang out and a, a great time. But that is not what it really means to be a follower of Christ. I didn't really understand what it meant to be a, a follower of Christ. I didn't grasp it. Je- Jesus gives us a clear vision and mission of what it means to follow him here. First, he says, give up your own way. Other versions say, deny yourself. And as I was thinking about what this really means, I couldn't help but think how selfishness gets in the way of being a follower of God. This includes being prideful. It includes being unwilling to allow God to do the work in our hearts. It gets in the way of what God wants to do. And I realize it's, it's unnatural to deny oneself. I mean, it's kind of innate in us to take care of ourselves, to, to want the best for ourselves, you know, to want to be healthy, to want to be successful, to be, want to be wise, uh, to want to protect ourselves. It's natural. Sometimes we we fail to realize that sticking to our own ways means leaning on our own ways and leaning on our own efforts and on our own understanding. When we when we do that, we're we're going against what the Bible really says. Look at Proverbs chapter three. Verse 4 and 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understandings. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. So it's not about doing things our own way. He's like, don't do it your own way. He can help us to not do it on our own way by his grace. By God's grace, he can help us with that. Paul even tells the Philippians uh, that giving up our own way and doing what pleases God comes from God. Why? Because it's not natural to come from us. Look at it in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. It says, For God, God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. It doesn't come from ourselves. He's giving it to us. You want to do what pleases God? You want to follow him? Allow God to do the work in your heart. So he says, give up your own way. Then he says, take up your cross daily. And we, we hear that term, take up your cross and follow him. You know, uh, I, I hear it in, in, in the Christian community, you know, we use that word. But do we really know how radical that statement is? The cross was an instrument of Roman torture. In fact, during during the time of Jesus, it's estimated that up to 30,000 Jews were crucified during the time of Jesus. The, The streets around Jerusalem were lined with hundreds of crosses with hanging dead or dying men during that time. So when Jesus is telling his disciples, take up your cross, there was meaning to that because they see this, you know, when they're walking around, they know how, how, what kind of a commitment this is. It's clearly more than, you know, just try your best to follow me, to serve me. It's a lot more than that. It's a total commitment. To take up your cross means you're all in. A.W. Tozer was asked 
What does it mean to take up your cross? And I love his answer. His three-part answer. He says, to be crucified means three things. One, a man who is crucified is facing only one direction. But two, a man who is crucified is not going back. He said his goodbyes. He's not going back. And then the third one is, man who's crucified has no further plans of his own. When, when you're crucified, you're only facing one way. You're not going back. You have no more plans on your own. You're, you're done with your own life, with your own plans, with your own way of life. It's a total abandonment of your ungodly wants and desires. That's what it means. And that's final. You take up your cross, that's a final thing. It's a serious thing. And he says, take up your cross daily. Is that, that one word? It's all different. It's not just a one-time thing. It's daily. We do this. It's not a one-time event. It's a daily mission that we are on while we're on this earth. Take up your cross daily and follow me. God, God's not just inviting us into a relationship with him. He's inviting us into total transformation to giving up our own way, taking up our cross daily and following him. It's bigger than ourselves. It's a part of a worldwide movement that Jesus started. We're all part of it. God's inviting us to join him on this massive worldwide mission to do what? To follow him, to reclaim the lost. Now, if you've been in church for a while, you might be nodding, you know, okay, God's mission is my mission. Got it. What's next? <laughs> Think about it. It's not that easy. It's not that easy. It's one thing to know it intellectually, but it's another thing to put it into practice. The enemy wants us to be off mission. He wants... He doesn't want us to follow Jesus. He doesn't... And you know what? If he can't get us to sin, if he can't get us to disobey God, then he will make us busy. He'll try and distract us from our mission. In fact, I, I think one of the enemy's most powerful tools to get us off mission is the weapon of distraction. I agree with that. How many of you have a cell phone? If you do, let me see your cell phone. Okay. All right. Somebody doesn't. All right. Good. 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 You know, the average person checks their cell phone 110 times a day. That works out to be about nine times an hour. I'm above <laughs> In fact, with those numbers, you know that just in the time that we're here together, many of you might have checked your phone 12 to 13 times. Well, I've got my Bible on here. Okay, I, I, I get that. I get that. That's probably what you're talking about, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. But it, it's staggering numbers. 47% of Americans report not being able to, do, to go a single day without their phone in their hand. You know, one, one day, Christy and I were going out to eat, and we get to the restaurant, and, you know, I shut the car, and we're getting ready to leave, and I'm looking, my phone's not there. And I'm like, oh, it's at home, I forgot it at home. And I did everything I can to try to convince her, hey, let's go back to the house and go grab it. And she's like, Really? She's like, here, you can hold mine. <laughs> it's just not the same thing, you know what I'm saying? I, I went through a whole lunch, and you know, after maybe about 
couple of minutes, I was, I was fine. It was clear, and it was good. It, 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 was, it was like pretty great. We had great conversation, you know, and, and, uh, and not that I pull out the phone, you know, but, you know, I didn't have that, and, and it was okay. It was okay. I, just, I was thinking about that because I went the first, you know, 28 years of my life, we didn't have cell phones. It's like, how, you know, 20, 30, maybe 30 years, I don't know, somewhere around there. But it's like, man, you know, we, we get so uh, addicted to it. Just, there's no reason to even, I mean, there's not like anybody was really texting me during that time or there was anything important. Like, what if I miss, you know, I was telling her, what if I, you know, what if there's an emergency and they're trying to get a hold? And she's like, well, I got my phone. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> that makes sense. Wisdom of our wives. Awesome. 50% of teens admit to being addicted to their cell phones. It's simply something they can't live without. But you know what? That's not the only reason that we, get off, we may get off mission. Jesus and his disciples were making their way to Jerusalem. And they're confronted with three different people who were all eager to follow Jesus. Let's take a look at it in uh, jo- uh, John chapter 9, uh, verse, starting from verse 57. It says, As they were walking along, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. But Jesus replied, Foxes have dens to live in, and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to even lay his head. He said to another person, come follow me. The man agreed, but said, Lord, first let me return home and bury my father. But Jesus told him, let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. Your duty is to go and preach about the kingdom of God. Another said, yes, Lord, I'll follow you, but first let me say goodbye to my family. But Jesus told him, Anyone who puts a hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. I know what you're thinking. Man, Jesus was a mean guy, wasn't he? I mean, the guy just wanted to be there for his father, you know, during his last days. Guy just, the other guy wanted to just say goodbye to his family. Seems reasonable. Why would Jesus not want them to do that? See, what Jesus was doing here, he was explaining the true cost of being on mission with him. From this passage, Jesus identifies three distractions that will pull us away from the mission that Jesus has called us to do. First of all, we have the distraction of comfort. A man walks up ready to follow Jesus and says that, uh, and Jesus says that his mission is going to lead, may lead to homelessness. Look at it again. He says, but Jesus replied in verse 50, he says, in uh, verse, yeah. Foxes have dens to live in and birds have nests, but the son of man has no place even to lay his head. Now, we, we don't know how that person responds, but it's implied here that this was a deal breaker for him. He was interested in following Jesus as long as it didn't take him out of his comfort zone. How many of you know that following Jesus, the way he wants us to follow him, will not guarantee that we're going to be comfortable? Jesus said, they hated me, they're going to hate you. James tells us when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. When your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. It's not comfortable to deny ourselves. It's not comfortable to take up our cross daily. I mean, our world is obsessed with Safety and comfort. Stores are full of gadgets that are designed to make our lives easier 
or to just calm us down. I love those widget things, you know, little spinny things, little stress balls. You know what I'm saying? There's so many good things out there that, that kind of help us in that. And, and you know, really now with uh, AI, comfort and, and ease will be taken to a new level. Maybe just for a little while, but that's a different story. But what happens when comfort becomes big, a bigger deal in our lives than following Christ? In fact, I'm going to be as bold to say that if our lives are extremely comfortable, then we should ask ourselves, are we really following Christ? Are we growing? Are we allowing him to transform our hearts and minds into his image? Because if we are, then it's going to be uncomfortable. When there's surgery done, there's usually pain associated with that. Next, there's the distraction of commitments. Jesus turns to another person and he initiates the conversation. He says, he said to the other person, to another person, come follow me. The man agreed, but he said, Lord, let me first return home and bury my father. And when you read that, don't you kind of picture this guy's on his deathbed and, uh, and Jesus is telling the son to leave him there alone and follow? I mean, who would say that to someone? That's not the case here. I mean, if you really think about it, if the guy had just died or if he was in his deathbed, then that son would probably be t- tending to his dad's needs. So this wasn't the case. Jesus, the guy wasn't in hospice. His commitment, uh, the man wanted to wait until he had accomplished what he wanted to do before following Jesus. That's the truth here. His commitments took precedence over following Jesus. The mission to follow Jesus is an urgent mission. It's not something that we do when our schedule finally has some room for it. It's not like uh, it's... uh, Paul even writes... Uh, In 2 Corinthians, he says, Indeed, the right time is now. Today is the day of salvation. There's an urgency to it. It's today. Don't put it off. The man actually says two words that are telling to Jesus. He says, Lord, first. And he says, Lord, first, let me, you know. And, and. You know, we, we see that in our lives. You know, Lord, I'll, I'll, I'll give you my heart when I'm ready. Or I've, I've got too much going on in my life right now really to take God seriously. You know, sometimes we tell ourselves that. Or, or let, me, let me first clean myself up a bit and then I'll turn to God in this area of my life. There's nothing wrong with wanting to take care of his family. The problem was... They're putting this as priority over following Jesus. That, that, that's the problem. Putting it over is more of a priority. In the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus said, Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. Jesus promises that if we place the kingdom first in our lives, then he will take care of all the other things that we're stressing about. So, are there things you've told Jesus, yes, but first, Lord, I'll serve you, but first, let me get through this busy season in my life. Lord, I'll give, but first, let me get my finances in order. Lord, I'll I'll share my faith. But first, let me get comfortable with who you are, with, with your word. Let me study. Let me, let me uh, take classes. Let me, 
Let me walk with you a while before I share your love with others. Lord, I'll, I'll spend more time reading the Bible in the morning, but first let me hit that snooze buzz button a couple of times. Commitments are good. Honoring our commitments are also extremely important. But if they take the place of following Jesus and keeping us from fulfilling our mission, then there's a problem with that. And then the third distraction the distraction of competition. As Jesus continues to walk, another man approached. He says, another said, yes, Lord, I will follow you, but first let me say goodbye to my family. But Jesus told him, anyone who puts a hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Once again, this seems harsh. I mean, I can't imagine just dropping everything and going on a missions trip with somebody you just met and not saying goodbye to people. And if you think about it, this was before social media, before internet. You know, it's not like he could have taken a selfie with Jesus and the crew and put it on social media. Hey, this is where I'm going. I'm going to be away for a while. It's none of that. And as I was thinking about this, it was like, what if this was simply a matter of humility? What if he had responded, Jesus, I'll follow you. Hey, would it be all right if I, if I just went and said goodbye to my family and told them where I was going? Would that have been all right? He didn't do that. Instead, he put conditions on serving God. God, I will follow you, you if you do this first, if you allow me to do this. What was Jesus' answer? You, you can't serve me and still desire the world. You can't have it both. What are some things that are competing with our commitment to serving God? Is it our desire to be right? Is it our need for control? Is it our need for acceptance? In the beginning, I asked this question, what's my mission? The mission Jesus laid out for us was to give up our own way, take up our cross daily, and follow him. And you know, G Jesus' mission was not about creating a following. It wasn't about... Uh, how many people would join his crew. Jesus' mission was about transformation. It was about making followers. It was about creating disciples. It was about getting people to be willing to grow. That's what it was about. It was about getting people to be willing to allow him to transform our heart. And the primary characteristic that he was looking for in his followers was humility. Will I lay down my own comforts? Will I lay down my other commitments? And things that compete for my time, my treasures, or my talents to follow Jesus. I just want to leave you with some questions. Are there any comforts that you have made more important to Christ, to following Him, to being on mission? Are there any commitments that you're saying, yes, Lord, but, but first? God wants us to follow him. God wants us to be all in. We've been hearing this term all in for the last three weeks now. Let's be all in. God's calling us to be all in. Are there any competing things in your life 
that you know, may, may be good, but they become more important than your calling to follow Christ, to make him known to others. That's a challenge. Some of you may need to recommit to following God. You're like, well, I know God. I have a relationship with him. Yes, but have you committed to following him in this area of your life? Or have things become more important? As we, as we worship, you know, let, let's, let's stand. And, and if, if any of this... Uh, hits your heart and and you're saying, you know, I there's there's things in my life that that have gotten in the way of pressing forward in that mission and following that mission that he's laid out for me. Then I would encourage you to give that to him and say, Lord, I'm sorry. It comes first with apologizing to him, with a repentant heart. Lord, I confess this to you. I've had this area of my life in, in front of you, ahead of you. I had to do that with my phone. When I realized that, and, and I'm a pastor, come on, I, you know, I mean, it's like, really? Yeah, we, we all struggle with different things in our life. Maybe something that wasn't there before now has kind of become more important to an area of following. Once those things are revealed in, in your life, that's the moment where we say, okay, Lord, I just realized, oh, this has become a stronghold. This has become a roadblock. This has become a barrier from knowing more of you. Lord, I give this to you. Maybe you need to fast that for a while and say, Lord, this has been a problem for me. I'm going to put this aside for a while. And during that time that I would have done that, I'm going to be praying to you. Hey, we're, we're in the middle of a 21-day fast right now. So do that. As he brings up things in your life that, that are getting in the way, give that to him. Lord, I'm good. I, I mean, how, look, I, how many want a deeper relationship with him, with God? Okay. Sitting around and just being comfortable is not going to get us there. It's willing to say, okay, Lord, I'm going to take this step. Thank you for dealing with this area of my life last week. Now, this other thing has come up. Let me take this to you. Let me confess, Lord, I'm sorry, Lord. I have made this an idol in my life. Let me give this to you. He takes it away. Hey, next week there'll be something else. That's fine. I'll deal with that. Let's, let's deal with this right now. How many of you with me on this? It's, it's hard. I know, I know, I know. But let's stand, let's worship him. And, and if there is something in your mind right now, give it to him. Say, Lord, I confess this to you. I'm sorry, take it. Roll me closer to you. Amen? Let's worship him. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh
bring it to your, if you ask him, he will bring it to your attention. Take those things. I really encourage you to do that. And you'll see breakthroughs in your life like you've never seen before. Amen. Lord, go with us today, Lord. Let that word burn in our hearts, Lord. Bless our families, Lord. Keep us safe, Lord. Draw us closer to you, Lord, I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, this is Pastor Paul. I just wanted to take a moment and personally thank you for being a part of our service this morning. If something in this message touched you or you decided to commit your life to Jesus and you want to know more about furthering your relationship with Him, please reach out to me. Send me an email. I know that these are tough times and we could all use some encouragement. And one of those ways is to worship live together. Uh, if you live in the Grey New Gloucester, Maine area, we'd love for you to join us on Sunday mornings at 10.30 a.m. And if you're not in this area and you don't currently have a church, I would encourage you to reach out to a church near you, a Bible preaching church. Make sure it is very important where you'll be encouraged and strengthened in your walk with Jesus. Hey, listen, Jesus loves you. We love you. Have a wonderful day.